Hello everyone, welcome back to this uh, second session of uh, Artificial in Intelligence for Hydrogen and Renewables. I am Diana Lacoste. For those who don't know me, I'm an associate professor of mechanical engineering here at KAUST, and I will be sharing this session. We will have five speakers. The last one will be on Zoom. Uh, he's in Canada at the moment. In the middle, we'll have a break, and uh, I'm sure you will have a lot of interesting questions for our fantastic uh, speakers. We will start with uh, Antonio. Uh, Dr. Antonio Attili uh, is an assistant professor of computational reactive flows at the University of Edinburgh. He got his uh, master degree in aerospace engineering and his PhD degree in theoretical and applied mechanics from the Sapienza University of Rome. And today he's going to talk about how we can use um, uh, machine learning for turbulent combustion. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and uh, uh, thank you for, to the organizer uh, to in, for inviting me. I've been uh, working in Kaos for a few years in the past, so I'm, also, I'm always very, very happy to, to come back here and uh, you know, experience the old feelings of, of being here. So today I'm going to talk about some uh, tests, some assessment and analysis we did on uh, convolutional neural network for the modeling in the sense of uh, closure model for uh, large eddy simulation um, for turbulent combustion, turbulent premix combustion mostly. So as many of you, I couldn't resist of putting something from the rock star AI of the, of the day, which is uh, this chat GPT. And uh, I asked about something about turbulence and machine learning and uh, put in the in form of a poem. And uh, you see, the, the answer is interesting. You have some you know, description of turbulence at the beginning and some uh, you know, assessment, of, uh, some uh, you know, uh, uh, thoughts about the use of machine learning that could reveal some you know, insight in the, of, the, of, the, of the flow field and uncover some uh, hidden relationship patterns and connection and so on. So the AI is fairly, it's fairly confident in itself to be able to do something useful. And also at the end, you can see that the AI declares its love for, for turbulence itself. So it gets a little bit romantic at the end, which is, which is interesting. So first of all, let me acknowledge uh, the people I've been working with. So my group in Edinburgh, so these are uh, PhD students mostly that have been working for me, um, with me. And um, uh, I was in Aachen before in Germany, so I've been working a lot also with, this, uh, uh, with these people. And also I should acknowledge the AI directly because we have been using, uh, or we started to use uh, this thing to produce code that has been used actually in some of the analysis that I'm gonna show uh, today. So it's uh, becoming a useful tool in our, in our uh, pipeline of uh, analysis. Okay, these are a couple of random thoughts, my thought about why we, we, we could use machine learning in this, in this business. And uh, well, one thing is that, well, most of, I mean, the model that we have are certainly not completely uh, reliable, completely accurate to do what we would like to do with this, uh, with this kind of uh, simulation. One of the reasons is that we have new challenges created by the, the, the two-day world. I mean, uh, climate crisis is one of the things, so that means hydrogen and many other things that we have to uh, deal with, which means new technology. So different tools, different devices, and so on, which means also that some of the models that we developed before, let's say for the space shuttle, might not be useful for what we need to do today, like a, a steel plant or whatever, okay? Uh, another observation that I think it's important to recognize is that many of the breakthrough in uh, turbulent modeling and, and um, especially in, uh, uh, in CFD, fairly old. So if you look at the very famous things like the, I don't know, Dynamics Magonisky for LES or some of the very famous uh, you know, combustion model, they're not very recent, okay? So they've been around for a long time, so probably there is you know, space for some new idea. And we have been saying that for one day and a half already that ML is extremely powerful, so why not try to use it? I mean, it's a, it's a good point. And uh, the other thing mentioned many times, well, we have a lot of data from the NSN experiment, for example, in this specific uh, context, and we have also very powerful computers. So that's something that enable, enables the, the use of machine learning. And the other thing, which is somehow overlooked, uh, we use data-driven data approach without ML with a lot of success in the past. I mean, the 
flameless model with tabulation is an example of that. So these are powerful things that have been extremely successful. So, <clears throat> so this is an example of the new challenges, right? So hydrogen combustion. When you have an hydrogen flames, um, you generate uh, very complicated flow field, very complex uh, combustion dynamics. This is an example of what can happen. This is supposed to be a laminar fluff flame, but if you simulate that in a 3D domain and you let it evolve as it would like to evolve, it, it generates this very complicated corrugated structure, and this is the heat release over the surface. You see it's completely non-homogeneous. It's, it's a crazy thing, which was supposed to be just a 1D simple thing, okay? So if you do that in a more, you know, uh, uh, mathematical way or more precise way in a statistical sense, it means that if you look at the surface, let's say, right, you can have a very wide range of values of the burning rate locally, okay, which is very, very difficult to model, very difficult to capture in a CFD context, for example. And this is very different to what we used to, for example, for methane. This is a typical almost planar lama, la, uh, uh, methane flame. And you see, if you do this statistical analysis, the scatter around this line is very, very small. So that means you can uh, use a fairly simple model to describe this kind of combustion, which certainly doesn't work for hydrogen. So this is the kind of complication we have to face, and we don't have good models for those. Okay? Now, this is an example of what I, I was saying. We've been using data-driven model a lot. This is the, what a typical you know, uh, flamelet model uh, uh, pipeline is, right? So you develop a database of 1D flames, so simple... Uh, uh, simple cases, and then you end up parameterizing this 1D data in a certain way with a number of variables, with some regression in some way, and then you plug that in in an actual uh, CFD solver. So in this thing, you use a data-driven model based on a very simple database. And as I said, this has been extremely successful in many cases. Uh, this is a recent example of the same thing uh, from uh, our work. So uh, in this case, we used an LES a model for the subgrid variance, which is another, one of the other things that you need to uh, uh, close in an LES uh, model, and we extracted this model for the variance from the DNS data. So we have the DNS data, we take this uh, dose, and uh, we do some regression in the form of the optimal estimator here, the details are not important, but you, you end up building a, a data-driven model from the DNS, and we have seen that this is better in this specific case for, uh, with respect to classical uh, you know, algebraic and uh, uh, other type of models for the, so, so the, for, for the variance. So I would say that in general, data-driven models are very, very promising. Okay, so just to set up the, the scene here, okay, what, what we're trying to do. So when you do an LES, you have an equation, okay, for whatever variable, let's focus here just on one variable, this is C. It's the progress variable that describes combustion. It can be, you can think about this as temperature, for example, that goes to a min, from a minimum to a maximum through the flame. When you solve this in the LES, you filter this equation, okay, because the grid that you have is too coarse to resolve that completely, so you have to coarse grain, let's say, this equation. You end up with a bunch of terms, and some of, the, of those terms, since they are non-linear, they become unknown, okay? So this C dot here, which is the reaction rate, we've been discussing that a lot, it's unknown as a function of C filtered, C tilde, okay? So we need a model to close this thing, okay? So classically, you end up with some analytical model, some function that describe that, okay? Now, the, the idea here, okay, let's replace the, the relation between this input and this output with a neural network which is trained on DNS data. That's the basic idea, okay? So how do you do this? You have your DNS data, you know, something large data with a lot of samples and so on. You compute what you need to compute, so the C and its rate, you filter it to be consistent, let's say, with the LES you want to perform. The same for the reaction rate, so you have an input field, an output field, and you go from the neural network that needs to learn this, this relation, okay? There are a number of questions on that, right? I mean, first of all, does it work, okay, at all, okay? And uh, also, what kind of ML approach is reasonable for that? Uh, artificial neural network, a, a CNN, some local or global you know, representation and so on. But a very important thing, and I will focus mostly on that point here, is the extrapolation and generalization of these things, okay? So when we train these things, we necessarily have to do a DNS, or we have to do some, uh, we have to produce some data. It's very unlikely to be able to produce data at the same condition or the same scale of a gas turbine, okay? So you have to do something I call small, 
okay, that needs to be applied in something large, okay? So this extrapolation generalization has need to be understood in this specific context, okay? And the robustness, of course, is an important thing, okay? So this is the kind of architecture we've been using. It's a convolutional neural network. That means we feed the neural network with field, in general, 3D fields, okay? So we are not like just talking about single points that we sample here and there, but we feed the entire uh, uh, field, which is very similar to what you do when you have image recognition, right? You feel the entire image. You want to somehow be able to represent the structure of the field with your neural network, okay? And as I said, the input here is C and the output is C dot in this specific case. So this is basically what we do. We have a bunch of snapshots from, from a, a flame, let's say an hydrogen flame in this example. We train our neural network, this uh, thing here. It's a deep neural network with a lot of layers, with a lot of you know, uh, weights and so on, millions of them. And then we test it. And the first simple test you can do just to check if it works is to use the same DNS case to test your analysis filtered in exactly the same way, but just picking a different snapshot. So this training and testing data are statistically consistent, okay? So they contain the same type of information, even if they are uh, instantaneously different, okay? So the first thing you can do, and that's what you get. This is, I'm gonna show a lot of this kind of graph here. So this is a joint PDF of the, uh, uh, the target value, which is the truth, the exact solution, if you want, the DNS value, and this is what the CNN, the neural network, predicts, okay? Ideally, you would like to be on this uh, on this line, okay? So this is a, an example in the turbulent combustion context. It's an example of an extremely good model, okay? This is pretty much the best you can get. So that means the deviation with respect to this line is very, very small. If you see here, this is also a log scale. So it really, you know, highlights the, the difference, what doesn't work. So this is an extremely good model. So in this very simple case, the, the simplest thing you can do, this thing works extremely well, okay? This has been known for a few years now. We've been testing it and uh, you know, playing with it, and, uh, and so on. So one thing I mentioned <clears throat> was also, uh, you know, you have to be a little bit careful in which kind of ML you want to use for this thing. You have to take into account a little bit the physics of your problem when you select a certain type of machine learning, okay? So one thing we, you know, we thought at the beginning, well, an artificial neural network versus a CNN, it's the first thing you might want to uh, think about, okay? Now, there are a few observations about a turbulent flow field, which are very important, right? If you take a, this is a, a, just a slice of an hydrogen flame. If you zoom in here, okay, this is the field of the reaction rate, okay? So you can think about this envelope as the flame, okay? You can see that this is green here, blue here, white here, so that means that along the flame, things change a lot, okay? If things change a lot, that means you, and the way they change, they change in relation to what's happening around, okay? If you see here, the reason why this is green, which means a high value, it's because there is a curved region, okay? But this curved region is fairly large, okay? So that means the value here depends on what's going on in a fairly large region, okay? And that's an important thing that you, you need to take into account. You cannot inject in a model something like this if you include gradients, okay? But there are issues because the gradient gives you only the variation locally and not really a variation along a very large scale, okay? And also gradient, gradients are hard to predict, hard to describe, and so on, okay? So that means if you use a, a, an artificial neural network in which you have only the local state as an input, okay? You can put a million of these local state in each and every point, but they are disconnected, okay? The neural network doesn't know that a certain point is close to another one in an ANN. So that's something that we never really tried just because we decided, well, it's probably not gonna work uh, very well, and it doesn't work very well, actually. So that's why we switched to, the, to this, oh, we started with this convolutional neural network because you have as an input a full field with all its connections, all the, all the structure and so on. And you get an output which is a 3D field, okay? So the point here that I want to make a little bit is that the physics of the problem, which is turbulence structures in this specific example, but I think this is true in everything, should be taken into account when you select what kind of ML to use, okay? Just trying it and seeing what happened, in my opinion, is, you know, tends to fail. Okay. Now, uh, another thing that has been mentioned here is that uh, you could use machine learning to discover something. Matthias showed an example of this. 
uh, where he discovered an already known model, okay? which is a good thing. Okay? So we try to do this, for example. So if you compare these two flames here, this is a methane flame. So you see very homogeneous burning rate. These are hydrogen flames, so very complex uh, structure. That means that if you want to somehow parameterize this flame, you need at least a couple of variables. And this is shown in this, in this error analysis, right? So if I, this is an error. So if I parameterize what's happening here with just one variable, I get a very large error. This is you know, uh, 0 0.6. This is normalized. So this is a huge value. It's 60% uh, you know, or, or so. If you use two variables, you get a much smaller thing. So this is known. We have been studying that in hydrogen a lot. We understand this. This is the, physical, the, the point of view of the physical analysis, OK? Clear. So statement is, we need two variables, C and Z, OK, in this specific case. We tried with the CNN, and we found that just with one variable, as I shown you in the previous slide, we, we can get an extremely good accuracy in representing this field, OK? What does that mean, what we discover here? We discovered that the same information that here I'm explicitly taking from the variable Z through the machine learning can be recovered by the 3D field of C, okay? So this is a way also, in, on top of modeling, it's also a way to discover the physics in the sense that the same information that are available through Z or that are embedded in Z are also embedded in the three-dimensional field, okay? And you can go on. I mean, I've been, we've been trying that uh, a little bit. Um, since a CNN as a as a, a convolution kernel, which means some sort of scale analysis, you can think about a trained machine learning model as a way to investigate the data on which that has been trained. So you can look at what the machine learning give you, okay, in order to understand what's the physics of the problem, okay? So this could be an extremely fancy tool to replace something like a spectral analysis, for example, okay? Much more powerful, much more flexible. So this is something that we are exploring. I don't have to go, time to go through this, but that's something we are looking at. Now, the main point I want to uh, make today is uh, to show some analysis we have been doing in terms of this generalization and extrapolation, doesn't matter how you call it. So this is a bunch of DNS data. Most, I mean, these are data that have been produced over the years. And they are very large DNS. They are very different and so on. But they are very, very small compared to the real application. Okay? This, the size of these domains are usually a few centimeters or something like this. Okay? So that means we're never going to be able to do the DNS of this to train a model of on, with that data, right? So how do we go from this to this? Okay, what do we have to take into account? Can we learn a little bit the recipe to go from here to here? That's what we're trying to, uh, to explore here. And uh, so that's the size. So you can think about this as low Reynolds, for example, simple configuration, which we have here, okay, to high Reynolds and complex geometry that we have here. And another thing I mentioned before, you remember, I said that when you do LES, you have a filter. So you filter your equation. So there is a filter size, okay, which is at the first approximation the size of the grid you're going to use in your LES, okay? So what's the effect of this filter size? What happens if you change the filter size? If you train a certain filter size and apply to another one? So that's another thing we've been, uh, we've been studying, okay? So one thing we started to do, we, take, we took a, a series of DNS, okay? Each of one of these is twice as big as the previous one, okay? This is huge. This is about, you know, 25 billion points. It ran on cows, actually, a few years ago, using, I don't know, uh, let's say $1 million of electricity. That's, let's put it like this, which is a very clear number, okay? And then we trained a few models, one on this, one with this data, one with this data, and so on. And imagine that your gas turbine would be here, very far in this extrapolation thing. So we're trying to draw a line here and to see if we can say, well, if this line is benign enough, we can think that maybe we can get to the asymptotic state. So that's the idea, okay? So we train this and we test it, and that's what we get, okay? So this matrix here, each one of these things is a model trained, let's say, on simulation one and tested on one, trained on one and tested on two, on two and so on, okay? You can see that they work fairly well. There are some differences. There are some things. And, I mean, we summarize that uh, with a single number for each of these tests. So each one of these uh, lines, right, the red, the green, and so on, are for a different model. So the blue line is a model trained with very, very small data. And you see that when you go extrapolating to higher or uh, to larger scale, it gets worse and worse, okay? As, as you move to 
larger and larger training set, okay, you get, the, uh, you get better accuracy, but that's not really important. That's kind of obvious. But what's very important here is that this, flame become, that this line becomes flat. Okay? That means that if your data are at a size which is large enough, the extrapolation tends to be benign. Okay? So going from this to this, it's much better than going this, from this to this. Okay? So for the same jump in size, you get a very small degradation of, per of performance. So that's what we wanted to prove, and it seems to, to, to work. And this is strongly related to the physics of turbulence, because turbulence tends to, depend, to become asymptotically the same, so asymptotically independent of the condition if the Reynolds number is high enough. Okay? So this is something that you have a model that kind of reflects what you expect from the physical point of view and behave consistently, which is a good news. Okay? We tried also some crazy thing. We took, we took a very um, a, a mixing layer, not reactive, so there is no combustion here at all. This is just turbulent. We trained the model on this and we applied it to a, to a flame, okay? Something that well, probably doesn't work, okay? So again, very large simulation. We did this test and that what happened, right? So the, the interesting here, thing here is this graph on the left. So we trained the model with this data and we tested on this. And you see that the performance are not very bad. Okay, they become bad at a certain point here for very small value, which is actually relevant here, but it's an interesting case to study anyway. What's happening here is that there are an, the problem here is that the values of the, of the quantity we are trying to model here are not present here. So a very small value, 10 to the minus 3, never happened here. So there is no way for the neural network to dream up about this value. So that's the reason why it's not working, okay? But it's not because conceptually this thing cannot be done. So this is a very, there was a very interesting and very good news in this kind of uh, analysis. Now the last thing I want to show is this effect of the filter size. So this is an example of, a, of an LES of a model combustor, right? There is a swirl, there is you know, a lot of uh, stuff going on here. If you imagine the grid, that you need to use to resolve this thing, you probably have very small grid elements around here, much coarser here. So that means that the, re the, the filter size that we are using in this simulation is completely different here, there, and so on, okay? So whatever model we want to use has to be able to represent the physics for different filter size. And actually, the situation is even worse, because in an actual LES, you don't even know what's the filter size. You say it's the size of the grid, but that's like a very, very crude approximation, okay? So, as I said, we tried this, sorry, we tried this, and first of all, we just did the sanity check. So if I train a model with a certain filter size, let's say four, and I test on the same filter size, it works very well. Very well for this value, very well for this value. Now, if I move to a different case, so I train with four and test with eight, eh, fairly bad. Train with four and test with 16, extremely bad, and the same here, okay? This is not unexpected, okay? So if you use inconsistent data, you get bad results. Okay, fine. So next step is, okay, what if I start to take data and use them for training from each and every filter size I could generate, okay? So I do, a, let me call it a super model, collecting data at every filter size, and then I test it at four, eight, and so on. So the, train, the, the model here is always the same, trained on a lot of data and tested on a different, um, on different filter size, and it works fairly well. And you can also get a little bit more picky here, comparing that uh, this model is better than the model with just one filter, or, or you know, uh, it's not worse than just one uh, filter size and, and things like this, to so be really, really precise, okay? Now, we started then to go on with this, and we said, okay, I want to train with a lot of filter size, with, so with a lot of data, okay? Let's say with filter size of two, four, six, eight, ten, a lot of them, all of them, let's say, okay? And then I say, well, let's remove some of them. So I just do four, eight, and so on, and just eight and 16, okay? Just to do that in a very systematic way, okay? If I do this full model, let me call it like this, with all filter size, and I test it for each and every of these filter size, it works very well in every case, which is an extremely good news, okay? We were not completely expecting this, because this CNN tends to get confused fairly easily. So that was a, a very good news. Then we started to remove things, and you said that when you remove things, uh, here I, I removed the, the, the filter of two, for example, right? And this is a test with a filter of two, okay? And so you see, it gets fairly bad. 
Okay, so this is telling us that if you want to represent something at a certain filter size, you need to put this ingredient if you want your pot that you use to, to, for the data of the machine learning, okay? And we went even more, just two filter for training, a lot of, I mean, a lot of error here and there. Okay, these graphs are a little bit, bit difficult to see, so let's put, uh, put them in number. So the blue one here is a full model, and this is the corresponding error, okay? So as you can see, if I use all the possible data to train, and then you test it, and each and every one, it works very well always, okay? which is consistent with what I said before. Now, if I use only, so the big dots here are the, the, the data at which I trained, and then I tested uh, all of them, okay? And you see that when there is the testing, sorry, when there is the training at a certain filter, the performance at that same filter are very good, and they get a little bit worse in, for, let's say, out of sample uh, testing. But you can see also here that the, this, the thing starts to get worse Okay, also for a case in which this was included. Okay, so the data for this was here, but it still got a little bit worse. And if you push this even more, it's even more evident. Okay, here I have trained that, I use this for training, I get very good result for the testing at the same scale. But here, even if I use this, okay, I don't get very good result. And this is also something that we were not expecting. We were expecting this point to be here, okay? which is a kind of an interesting thing because it means that the, the, let's say the neural network here tends to get confused by the presence of something else. So that means also you need to be careful in adding new data. You have to do it properly and you have to think about what you're doing in this, in this uh, kind of thing. And uh, yeah, so um, yeah, so this is a little bit the, the conclusion here that you, the, the, the condition you want to have in your model need to be there. So you need to be, to cover with the training what you want that was, has been seen in many, many occasions. But that's probably not even enough because if you start to put many data, okay, you have to, um, to be sure to put enough of them. I'll give you an example with, I'll give, I finish, that's the last one. Um, so um, I'll give you an example, right? In image recognition, you have images of cats and dog, okay? If you have only cats in your training, you test with the cat, you recognize it. If you test, do the same do for dogs, works very well, then you put dog and cats in your training, and the dog are completely unrecognized now, okay? What happened, which is very counterintuitive, if you now put you know, lions, cats, horses, and so on, also the performance for dogs get better. So this is what this is telling you, which was not that expected here, okay? So these are the conclusion, just very quickly. CNN are promising. Uh, a thing that uh, I, I, I kind of try to remark here that you have to uh, take the physics into account, not only in terms of injecting the physics as a question, but also your understanding of physics in what you're doing, which I translated also another way. If you have a uh, machine learning model that works when it shouldn't, okay, it's a bad model for me, okay? Luck is bad here, okay? Because you're gonna fool yourself very easily, okay? And this is just a summary of this generalization that I discussed. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Antonio. Really interesting talk. So we have a few questions, we can start there. Um, thank you for your nice talk, Dr. Attili. Uh, my question is regarding when you do that DNS extrapolation. So let's say you want to do a full-scale physical device um, simulation, non-premix uh, bluff body flame. What DNA data do you need to train? Like, do you put like, I don't know, mixing layers, flames in a box, uh, jet flames, like to get a little bit of the physics of each of the canonical DNS cases or how, how, how will you approach this? I think there are two points here. One is that you need to have training which are at turbulent condition, at IRF Reynolds number, let's say. You have to get out of the, let's say, um, pathologies that low Reynolds number turbulence has because you're gonna pollute your, your thing. That's what we've shown here. But the other thing is also that we have to learn how to generate appropriate data for training. In the same way, when we do a flameland model, right, if I ask you, 
if you do a flame -like model for a methane flame, what fuel are you going to use for the, for the 1D flame? Well, methane. In the same way, we have to learn how to generate appropriate data to train model for a specific problem. And that's, I think it's one of the next steps in research that I will try to have. Yeah. Just a follow-on from this. Eventually, we want to generate predictive models. Yes. We don't really know if there will be a sort of a stagnation flame. We don't really know if suddenly, you know, I'm going to have um, a PVC. And so I guess what you're saying, you know, this is a tool that helps reduce the computational cost, but it does not solve all the problems. Am I good? Uh, I mean, I'm, uh, sh sure. I mean, I think there is no, uh, currently there is no model that's really, really universal, right? I mean, if you're doing, you know, uh, uh, the flow around an airplane, okay, and uh, you have curvature in the wing, you need a turbulent model that you know takes that into account. It's the same story. So you have to know a little bit of what you have to do in order to, uh, otherwise I think it's a, would be a scam. <laughs> I guess it's uh, <clears throat> your your uh, your experience is very close to human being in actual actual fact because when you're young you need to be trained properly yeah. with the right steps to to move along like you, you're going to wear your diapers for very yeah. long if you're not trained to to go to on to the washroom so so I guess I'm I'm not very surprised and and you 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 showed it very well so. Uh, so I guess, yeah, that, that's the danger of AI to, uh, you know, we eventually humans are going to be just copied and, and uh, it's just going to carry on from there. Absolutely. You want to choose the guide school for your kids, right? So that's a, that's a, thank you very much. I think we have to move to the next speaker. Thanks a lot, Antonio. Thank you.